beautiful morning that we can gather together and worship you and praise you for who you are and what you've done. And we thank you for your word as we dig in this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we are back in Hosea. It's been a few weeks. John reminded me it's been three weeks, I guess. I don't remember it was that long. Sometimes you think you know you're going to have three weeks and it gives you plenty of time to prepare, and then you actually prepare less when you have more time. I don't know, you procrastinate or something. So, all right, so we kind of ended um, uh, chapter three. We got through chapter one. We're going to kind of try to get through chapter two today. Um, just a little reminder on chapter one. Hosea, we're looking at the story of Hosea. God called Hosea to marry um, a prostitute, um, Gomer, and have children. And Gomer and Hosea had three children. Um, presumably, we say, or I say, she, he married Gomer, and he, she had kids um, out of whoredom. He adopted those kids, and then he had three children after that, which was Jezreel, um, No Mercy, and not my people, okay? Yes, sir. So they had more than three kids? Yeah, I, I, I would argue that they actually, um, taking the verse literal um, from verse 2, where it says, go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, um, and actually says, go take yourself a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom. That's literal in the Hebrew, okay? So it's it. I, I would... Think, I think that it's actually taking a wife that was a prostitute that had children already and those children were adopted and we'll see in verse chapter 2 verse 1 kind of an argument possibly for that that makes a little bit sense um, but then they had three children they had a son Jezreel they had a daughter um, no mercy and another son not my people okay <clears throat> and then we saw in chapter with the end of chapter 1 verse 10 through um, I guess it's just 11, 10, 11, um, that kind of this switch where God says, well, you are my people now. And, and it was like, what was the change there? It was the difference. We kind of argued that it was the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Talking about the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, this was uh, uh, a blessing and curse covenant. Basically, if you, if you were blessed, if you were obedient... And if you were disobedient, you were cursed. And the cursed was you were removed from the promised land. And that's what's going to happen to the Israelites. They are disobedient. God's done. And he's going to remove them from the land. And the Assyrians are going to come in and take them into exile. And so that's what he's talking about when he's talking to the nation of Israel. And then secondly, when he starts in verse 10, he goes back and he says, well, but but you are my people. But And it's like, well, what's God doing? Is he changing his mind? Is he confused what's going on we know that's not the case but so we'd say this is the new covenant this is the new covenant in my blood this is jeremiah 31 is what he's talking about here and this is that eternal covenant that's been from the beginning all the way back in genesis 3 15 all the way back there with the curse and we see the gospel right there and then we see that affirmed with abraham and jacob and isaac on down through the line and this is that eternal covenant that's going to happen. And then we see that the Gentiles, we see this verse quoted in 1 Peter 2, and we see it in, in Romans 9. So by Peter and Paul using this verse that once you were not my people, but now you are my people. And he's what they're including in that is the Gentiles. So now it's the Israel of God, the people of God. And this is everybody. And then if you look in the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text has chapter 2, verse 1 in chapter 1. So it must be verse 12, I assume. So it says, and, and he's going on, and, it, and, and I think that's probably, it seems to make more sense, that, that 2, verse 1 is actually included in chapter, the end of chapter 1, talking about this new covenant. Because in chapter 2, he says, Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. So he's going along these same lines of this new covenant. And there is a little argument for in this verse about kind of what I was talking about, that there's two groups of children. Because if you look, it says, say to your brothers, you are my people. Well, there was two brothers. There was Jezreel and not my people. So those were the two brothers that were from the relationship of Hosea and Gomer, 
either way at, when they were married, whether they were both Hosea's kids or not, but they were with when he was married. But he says then also plural, and to your sisters. So there obviously is more kids involved here at this time. So whether he's referring to then these other adopted children, possibly. So there's certainly more children involved either way. But verse 2 or verse 1, it seems to be talking about now, he's still talking about this new covenant. You are my people and say to your sisters and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Okay. So they're going to be, the nation of Israel is going to be removed from the promised land, but there is this eternal covenant that God has with his people that he's saying, you are my people and you have received mercy. Okay. So then I'm going to read a big chunk in um, chapter two here, starting in verse two and go through, and then we'll kind of walk through it. It says, plead with your mother, plead for she is not my wife and I am not her husband that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand." And I will put an end to her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lover has given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned them with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers." And forgot me, declares the Lord. Okay, so I think in in chapter 2, starting in 2, through the end of chapter 2, verse 23 or 23, it's, it's actually talking about the nation of Israel. It, it, it certainly applies to Gomer and this example that Gomer is for the nation of Israel, but it but it seems to be a talking about the relationship between the nation of Israel and Yahweh, okay? And if you look at verse 15, it kind of, we didn't read that one, but it kind of ties that in. It says, and there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So it seems, and there's other kind of things in this text that kind of allude to that, but, but it certainly seems like he's addressing the nation of Israel in this. But it certainly applies to Gomer because that's exactly what he's using. This marriage relationship is an example of between Gomer and Hosea is an example between the nation of Israel and Yahweh. Okay. So he says in verse 2, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face. So he's pleading with her to put away her whoring, putting away the nate talking. So think about the nation of Israel. Put away her whoring. So what was her whoring? Her whoring was going after Baal and other gods besides Yahweh. He says, so, so for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. So in this, most argue that this isn't talking about like divorce. You know, we think of this as, well, you're not my husband, you're not my wife. That this, don't think of it as divorce because Yahweh is still pleading. What's he doing? Plead with your mother. Plead for she is not my wife. So it's not a certificate of divorce. It's that Yahweh is pursuing her, but the nation of Israel has severed this 
because of their disobedience. They're the ones being disobedient. Israel has severed this relationship, not Yahweh. He still is there, but they have incorporated this Baal worship and Yahweh worship together. They've mixed it together. There's pretty much no difference between the two anymore in their minds. They, so they're, they're the ones who are, they're the ones that have, have severed this relationship, not Yahweh, because of their disobedience. So in verse 3, it says, Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. So in the Old Testament, and even now you could even you could probably argue this, that that if you're talking about nakedness is is a sign of need, for one thing. Um, so the Old Testament is a sign of need, and it was a sign of shame and guilt. And that's what he says, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born. So where she needs he- where she has need, and he's gonna take her where he's gonna take everything from her. And you're gonna see this as we go through. He's gonna strip her from everything, the nation of Israel, from everything that he's given her. Because he's the one that's given her flax and seed and wine and oil and all these things, but he is going to remove that from her. And it's a it's a sign of shame. Because that's what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is the sign of shame is going to come in. The Assyrians are going to come in, take them into exile. Here they were prospering. Everything was going great for them. They're looking like this, this, this prosperous nation. And now Yahweh's going to come in and let the Assyrians come in and wipe them out, take them away. And their shame and guilt as the Assyrians wipe them out. And then we see in verse 4, he says, Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. So we've switched kind of from the nation being pictured as a mother to now the nation being pictured as children. And we see this, this is what sometimes can be so challenging with the book of Hosea is, is the picture that he's using, it's changing, and it's going from once you were my people, now you're not my people, this old covenant, this new covenant, now the nation of Israel is, is represented as the mother, and now the nation of Israel is represented as the children. And, and that's what we're seeing here in verse 4. It says, upon her children also I will have no mercy. Because they are children of whoredom, for their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. So sometimes you think about it, it's like, man, it doesn't seem fair that you've got the mother was the one that was the prostitute. The mother was the one that did these acts. Now you have the children that are born into this, and now they are not going to receive mercy from God either. But this is exactly what's happened in the nation of Israel. It's like they've had children. They've followed these same lines. And, and if you look in the Old Testament, you think about it. This, is a, this really is a good picture because a mother, somebody that was a prostitute in the Old Testament, the children had the same stigma as the mother did. All these same things were applied right to the children as well. And, and, and a lot of times, those children lived that exact same life. They became prostitutes. Those same things happened. They followed in their parents' footsteps. She followed in their mother's footsteps. And that's the same thing with the nation of Israel. What did the nation of Israel do? The nation of Israel, generation after generation after generation, keeps following in the footsteps of their their fathers and their mothers. And they worshipped Baal. And they were in the temple. And they were prostituting themselves. And they were calling out to Baal, the fertility gods. Children did the exact same thing. So, they, were to, so there's, they would receive no mercy because they were children of whoredom. For their mother played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. And look at this. So, so for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. And we're going to see as we go along that Yahweh is the one that gave her those things. Yahweh's the one that did it. But she's attributing all this to her lovers. 
And so you got to think about this. Immediately we apply this, we're thinking Gomer and Hosea. But go back to thinking about this is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is giving all their credit to Baal for all the things that they have. So she goes after her lovers because she thinks that's who's supplying the needs for her. But Yahweh says in verse 6, he says, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. So what? Therefore, therefore, because of these things, I'm going to do this. So therefore is referring back to, in a sense, um, because God has mercy, because God pleased with, his, his, with, his, with the mother, because God is punishing them. All this is... All these things he's, he's going back to. Therefore, I will hedge her up because he loves her. He's going after her. And you got to think about it. Think about a hedge of thorns. As you're walking, you got hedges next to you. Where would you walk? Right down the middle, right? That's where you would go. You wouldn't turn off and walk into the thorns, right? But that's exactly what Gomer is doing. That's exactly what the nation of Israel is doing. And they don't even realize it. And I bet you in your life you do the exact same thing. We do. We think we go after these things. We go after sin, and we think this is a good thing. But it's like walking into the hedge of thorns. And for some time, we enjoy it. And there's prosperity, and so some of these things happen. But let me tell you, God is going to bring you back, just like he does with them. He's putting up these hedges of the thorns to keep them on this path. But they're running into them. They're going into him. They go, but he puts it there because he's trying to. And what a loving act of God to do this for us. I mean, think, it, it, just, just picture sin in your own life that causes destruction. And God uses things to just tear your life apart in sometimes in some sense. I can think back in my life many times that God has done that. And it's like, it's a good thing. It's actually a loving thing that God is doing this. So he puts up this hedge of thorns. It's all against her, so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. So he's going to control this, this situation to an extent. And, and, here's, and you think about it. He wasn't going to let the nation of Israel go any farther than they were going to go because he was going to send the Assyrians in. And he's like, I'm done. I'm not overlooking this anymore. This is done. And he's going to send them, send the Assyrians in. And if you look at verse 7, it's kind of a, a sad verse because it's like, she shall pursue her lovers. So this isn't somebody that's just sins coming to them. Because sometimes that happens. We're in situations where we walk into and we're like, man, I wasn't desiring to go down this road. This wasn't where I wanted to go. And all of a sudden, this, this, this temptations and stuff is presented to us. A lot of times, that's not the case. But that, that happens in our life. But, but you see, in this verse, she says, she shall pursue her lovers. She's intentionally going after them because she thinks this is what's good for her. And a lot of times, that's the same thing in our life. We're not just sitting back in sin and temptation, that stuff just, oh, poor me, it's coming upon me. Many times we're actually pursuing it, and we're going after it. And we may make up all kinds of excuses or whatever to make it seem like it's not, that's not the case. But that's probably, if you really examine your heart and examine your, yourself, you probably would look and go, yeah, no, I'm actually going after this. I'm actually pursuing it. But, what does Yahweh do? But not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. So he's going to make these, these thorns, these, these, these hedges, so that it's a struggle for her. It's a challenge for her to, to pursue. These are going to, she's going to see, which we say, which it, it says, then she shall say, I will go return to my, my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. 
So this hedge has, in this sense, has worked going, man, this road is a struggle. What am I doing? Why am I going down this? I, need, I should go back to my first husband because it was way better then than now. And when I look at this verse, I, I, it seems to me at first that the only reason she's going back is because times are tough. When things are hard, sometimes we're like, okay, I got to make a change. My heart might not be right, but I'm like, this is a disaster, and I can't keep going down this road because I'm sick of my life being a train wreck. My heart isn't right. I just I want some ease in my life, you know. And 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 it seems like that's the case there because she's looking, and going, man, th- this is tough. But I. I was thinking about this and I thought, I think this is even a, a grace of God, even in this. Because I think about before you were maybe even a Christian, you didn't even really think about God a whole lot. Um, I think back into my days before I got saved, and I, and I think, well, there was times that God, I believe, put like roadblocks and, and struggles and challenges in my life that I didn't fall into sin. My wife and I always talk about this all the time that it's amazing we didn't go down uglier roads. And I'm not sure. God protected us from going down these ugly roads. And I think sometimes was because of trials that you put in your life. You're just like, oh, I just, I'm not doing this anymore. This is just too hard. So I'm going to stop doing it. My heart wasn't right. But he protected us from going down these ugly roads that could have even destroyed our life, maybe destroyed our marriage, destroyed our kids, destroyed all kinds of things before we were saved. But then sometimes then what he, he does, he uses that, and then he gets a hold of our heart. A lot of times it's, you know, yeah, we see, we see the sanctification process. He gets a hold of our heart. He changes us. He makes us new. And then we change. We become holy. We become more like God. Usually that's, that's how it is. But I still think God even protects in that situation, which I think he did here with Gomer. And I think he's doing with the, the nation of Israel. They could have gone down an even uglier road than they did. So she won't, won't find them. She wants to return to her husband because it's better then than now. And in verse 8, And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold that she, that, um, which they used for Baal. So here it is. Yahweh is the one giving all these things. So here they are putting up their images in their land, their, in, in their their, their areas of crops, they're putting up images of Baal, the fertility god, and they're doing these things, and they're, and they're going into the temple, and they're, they're mixing their Yahweh worship with Baal worship, they're sleeping with temp, uh, temple prostitutes in the temple, all these things are happening, and they're mixing this all up, and their fertility, um, their, so all their, su- uh, I don't know what the word is, success, um, all, their childbearing and all those things that are prosperous for them as a nation, they're contributing in all this to Baal. All these things that they have, they're saying, Baal did this for us. But Yahweh is the one that does it. How many times, in, in our world today, this is, is obvious. I mean, we, we contribute everything to Mother Nature or... What's some other examples? I don't. Um, chance. What's that? Chance. Chance. Yeah. Or or oh, I was I, I did well. What's the what is it the I, karma? Thank you. Um, you know all these other things that we we do and we say, and and people in the world go yeah. Well, the weather, the karma, the chance, all these things, man, it sure worked out for me. Great. We contribute our success and our prosperity to these things, or just to our hard work, or great in America, our brains and our power, our technology, the things we've created, we've done. We contribute all of the success to that, to us. And, and it's all about us. What they were doing, they were contributing it to a higher power, they thought, Baal. And that's their success. But God's saying, no, I was the one that did that in chapter 8. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, and, the, and lavished on her silver and gold. I think it was Boyce. I, 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 I'm not positive because I think I read it a little, quite a while ago. 
I think he was talking about this passage, and he always uses kind of language to describe something, but it, it was kind of a picture of, he used, this, we're kind of talking about the nation of Israel, but he used Gomer and Hosea, which is this picture, so it, it, it works. He was like, he pers- Yahweh or, Gom- or Hosea pursues Gomer. She's with her lovers. She's with them. She's not being taken care of. There, she doesn't have what she has for her needs. So what's happening is, is Hosea goes to the door, and the lover answers the door. And he says, will you give Gomer this flax and this wine and the seed and this oil and all these things? And basically the lover slams the, the, takes the things and slams the door in his face, and the lover turns around and gives all these things to Gomer. And it's like she's sitting there thinking, well, this is coming from my lover's. This is coming from Baal, but it's actually coming from Hosea. It's actually coming from Yahweh. But they got it mixed mixed up. Because there's this meshing in the nation of Israel between Baal worship and Yahweh worship, and there's just just no difference. It's all mixed up, and they're, they're giving the credit to him. And he says, therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and in my and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. So therefore, I will take back. So therefore, because she's contributing all this to Baal, I'm going to take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. I will take away my wool and my flax, and I will uncover, I will cover which were to cover her nakedness. So Yahweh's going to take all these things. So the time of the season when grapes harvest, all these things, that it's not going to prosper. There's not going to be prosper in that, prosperity in that. Those things aren't going to happen. He's going to take them away. And then he says, Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. This seems to be talking about um, public shame here that's happening. Um, it seems to be that he's announcing out there that, you know what, here's the deal. I know um, the nation of Israel is unfaithful, and I'm putting it out there. And I think that is talking about possibly when the Assyrians are even coming in, and they're going to take them away. And their shame is going to be revealed. And no one's going to be able to take that from Yahweh. No one's going to be, because he's in control. Baal isn't even... Baal isn't even a god. No one's going to be able to do it. And he goes, and I will put an end to all mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages which my lover has given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals when she burned offering to them, and adorned herself with her ring and with jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. So these Sabbaths, these mirths with parties, laughter, her feasts, her new moon, Sabbaths, these these were all joyous times. These were all reminders of Yahweh's goodness. These new moon Sabbaths, These feasts, these are reminders of what Yahweh has done for them. So these were joyous times, but he's going to take that all away. And we know when the Assyrians come in, all those things are going to be removed. They're not going to have the ability to practice all these things and to celebrate all these feasts. And when we see in here vines... And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees. This, the, the vines and the fig trees, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an, uh, an understanding of affluence, prosperity, these kinds of things. He's going to take them away. He's going to destroy them. And then in verse 13, he says, And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers. So, He's looking back to the time when she worshipped Baal, when the nation of Israel worshipped Baal. And here they're thinking that those things are forgotten because there was generation after generation. All these things happened. They do these things, and they think God isn't watching. God isn't looking. God isn't doing anything. We have the same thing in the world today. 
We, the world is out sinning, living this life, not for God, not worshiping God, not praising God for what he's done. The majority of the people in the world wake up and never think about what God has done today. What God, they've given them the weather, God's given them all the prosperity they have, all the good things that they have, the food they have. They don't wake up and ever praise or thank God for that. Not once. That's exactly what was happening here. But Yahweh doesn't forget. Yahweh doesn't forget. He's going to come back and they are going to, he goes in 13, I will punish her for her feast days of the Baals when she burned offering to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me. Yahweh's going to punish them. The Assyrians are going to come in. There is going to be punishment happen. No different than in our world today. Let's look at two groups. There's the, the unbeliever and the believers. That's, that's basically what everybody's made up of, right? The whole world. Believers and unbelievers. If you take unbelievers, they may have prosperity. They may, everything looks good. We see plenty in the Psalms written about the frustration of David and other Psalm writers about they're looking on the wickedness and the evil that's happening. And they're looking and going, how can this be? Why is this happening to them? Why do they have everything that's good? And why am I suffering? But that time is going to be remembered. And as an unbeliever and they die in their sin, that punishment is going to happen. Even if it isn't in this lifetime, it's ultimately going to happen in eternity. And they're going to pay for every one of those things for eternity. As believers, sometimes we seem to, if you want to say, get away with sin and nothing happens to us in a sense of our taking something away or prosperity. We have struggles because of our sin. But let me tell you, that sin, one or two things, what happened is Christ paid for it on the cross. If you're a believer, you trusted in Christ today, Christ paid for that sin. But thank God that he puts, you, puts up hedges of thorns too. That we don't have to walk in sin because we can put this up and he gives us struggles and what does it do? It bounces us back and it turns us back to him. So we like to think, well, there's never any punishment for Christians. Well, I don't really fully agree with that. I think there is, in a sense, punishment, but there's not condemnation. You're not condemned for your sin. But do you think God isn't going to pursue you and punish you, in a sense, right here, right now? We, we call it discipline, but... In a sense, he's punishing. He's moving us, trying to. He's moving us back to get us to walk in the path again. And and we're not going to be punished in the sense of eternal punishment for that sin, because fortunately Christ paid for it, right? But our sin is going to find us out. It's going to happen. That verse in I think it's Numbers thirty-two. When and we're going to look at that here in a second, but. Um, where it's talking about Achan, and Achan hides the devoted things in his tent, I believe, and, um, and, it, and it talks about your sin will find you out. God knows. Nobody else knew. The whole nation of Israel, nobody knew that that, that was, was taken. But Yahweh knew. God knew it was there. And it's the same thing with us. It, sometimes we, we, I don't know what we do in our head, we think like God isn't watching and I think that's sometimes what, when you, when you look at the Old Testament, you think about Baal worship, sometimes people just want something in front of them. They would put up Asherah poles. They would do these different things to have images and these things in front of them. It was like, it was like well, why are they worshiping a carved image? That means nothing. But it was like it was something there for them. And I think sometimes we do the same thing. It's like we put our hope in the things that are right here that we can see and grasp. It's like I can... I can put my hope in my hard work. That's what I can do. I can put my hope in that because I can see it and I feel I can do it. And, 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 but, and we struggle and sometimes we put in our head like, oh, God isn't going to see what we're doing. And it's like, no, he, he really is. And so I think sometimes we set that aside. We have to correct our thinking and then go, yeah, we don't see God, but God sees everything we're doing. And God knows everything we're doing. So he says, and he went after, in verse 13, the end of that, and he went and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. 
and, and I think any time when you were, especially when we're talking about this time was prosperity, um, I always look to that Deuteronomy 6 pack passage when he's talking about all the things that, what's that? Oh, Deuteronomy 6 passage? <laughs> Sorry. Deuteronomy 6 passage where it talks about um, how God gives them all these things. Lest don't forget me. Because what happens is you have all these things as prosperity, which they had at this time. Under Jeroboam the, the second, they, were in, they had prosperity. And what did they do? Because of their prosperity, they forgot God. The nation of Israel forgot God. So in verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer in the days of her youth as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. And I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make, make for her a covenant on that day with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and the war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth to you, betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her, sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. So I think what we're going to see in this part of this passage is that we see this, this new covenant again, going back to, you're not my people, you are my people. I see we're going to see this, this, this people of God, this Israel of God, and there's a couple different ways to look at this, but let's just look at these first couple of verses first. 14, it says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her back into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. So back in the wilderness, you think about when they... They were redeemed out of Israel, or redeemed out of Egypt, right? They were taken out of Egypt. They were disobedient. They were grumbling. God then is going to wipe out that generation in the wilderness, right? And what does he do in the wilderness? He is sanctifying them. He's sanctifying them in a sense. It's, it's such a great picture of the gospel. We talked about this a while back, but it, it's just like God redeemed them out of Egypt, He's pulled them nothing, not because of anything they've done or any kind of special people that they are. He redeemed them out of Egypt, just like he redeems us. He regenerates us, changes us. Then what does he do? He took, took them into the wilderness. He's sanctifying them to then bring them into the promised land. Okay? So he's sanctifying them. And, and, and basically that, that whole generation falls off. He sanctifies them and then takes them into the promised land. So in that wilderness time, when we think of this wilderness time and bring her into the wilderness, this was a time where they were just, they were trusting in Yahweh. Okay? And, and, and they, would, they were responding to God. And so he's, he allures them, he brings them into the wilderness to speak tenderly to her. And he says, I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Now this valley of Achor was what I was referring to back in that Numbers 32, where it's talking about, this, it means trouble, is what it means. It was a time of trouble. And, and this, is the, this is where Achan, in the valley of Achor, where God kills Achan and his family, because they, they, they keep this... Stuff that was supposed to be devoted to destruction. Am I wrong on the story? This is Joshua, isn't it? It's in Joshua 7, 26. Yes. Sorry. Did I say I said numbers 32? Yeah. Oh, I was talking. Yes. No, it's Joshua 7, actually, that this is in. I'm screwed up on my passages, but yeah, it's Joshua 7, where this in the Valley of Achor, this is what happens, and, 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 and God wipes them out. This is, this is a time of trouble, and what's he's going to do? He's going to reverse this, and he's going to say, and make the Valley of Achor a door of hope, because they would think of that, and they would think, man, that, that, that means trouble, but it's going to be a door of hope. 
And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth and as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And now I think he's starting to go into thinking about this new covenant that he's doing. He's, he's, he's alluring. He's bringing them into the wilderness. And then he's going to move them into the promised land, which is talking about eschatological, which I think is what he's referring to here when we see in verse 16 on. And he says, and in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer you call me my Baal. So this syncretism, this, this, this mixed up mess that's going on between Baal worship and Yahweh worship is going to be over. And he says, you will call me my husband, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. Baal will disappear, and I will make for them a covenant on that day for the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and the war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. Okay, so now this can be a challenging passage because now dispensationalists will immediately go and say this is talking about the millennium because there's peace, there's the, the, the war is gone. All these things that the, this covenant is made with the nation of Israel with that millennial in the millennium for a thousand years with the Jews. And, and what's going to happen, they will reign with Christ and there will be no war. There will be none of these things. The animals will lie down with, there will, be, there will be a covenant with them. Everything's going to change. So a lot of people take it that way. It's thinking the dispensational type thinking. Or I think you can take this as the new covenant. And this is the final blessings of the new covenant. Eschatologically. So at the end of time, the new heavens and the new earth. Where the lion and the lamb we can lay down together, which we see in Isaiah. I think that's what it's, it's, it's talking about here. This eschatological final blessings that's going to take place. And he says, and I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Not that he's... In a sense, he's remarrying, but it's not like that certificate of divorce happened. It's that this relationship that was severed from the nation of Israel will not be severed because they shall know the Lord. This is the new covenant in that language right there. Flip to Jeremiah 31. So Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and of Judah. And I, and I, and I think this, this is talking about the new covenant. This is quoted in, in Hebrews. This is the covenant in my blood. And then if you look in verse 34, he says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sin no more. And, and so I think in verse 20, it says, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. I think it's referring, this is what this is talking about, is this new covenant. And then these are the blessings of the, the, the final blessings of the new covenant, the new heavens and the new earth. And then just to finish up these last couple verses. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord, and I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall and they shall answer Jezreel. So there's going to be a reversal of things that happened. These where God Yahweh takes these things away, where the grapes aren't going to produce wine, all these things are going to be taken away. That's going to be reversed. And he says, And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to him, Not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, You are my God. And I think this is talking about, this is, this is why I'm not a full covenant theology. Because I think it's that Jeremiah 31 is specifically talking about, they will all know me. I think there's some discontinuity between in the, the old covenant and the new covenant. I, I don't think it's just an extension out of it. Because I think it's like now everyone in the new covenant will know the Lord. Everyone will. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And it will say to my people, you are my people and you are my God. 
so everyone in this new covenant will know the Lord. And that's everyone who is trusted in Christ. That's everyone who is trusted in Christ. And everyone from the old covenant that looked forward to the Messiah to come, that trusted in the Messiah to come, and now we look back towards the Messiah and trust in what he has accomplished on the cross. Okay? So there's great hope in this passage because of the new covenant, because Christ has come, because Christ has died, because Christ has rose from the dead. So we have hope that we don't have to stand before God and, and, and he tells us there is no mercy and you are not my people because we are his people because of the new covenant, because we trust in Christ. Okay? All right, so on the next chapters, we will start to sum those up a little more and we will kind of take probably bigger chunks and just sum up. We'll read and just kind of um, not dig into each verse going through the next few chapters.